Good afternoon. Thank you very much for being here. Uh, my name is Derek Myers, and I chair the PHE Advisory Board, which has a task of helping PHE to stay independent uh, and credible and ambitious. It's my uh, lovely task to introduce uh, Professor Sir David Spiegelhalter as our concluding speaker over this very successful two-day conference. Uh, those of you who have been here for the two days know we started uh, with the minister, and I put it to you, we're ending with the master. Uh, both of those highly appropriate for this intelligent audience. I know you're going to get a great, a great uh, deal from what Sir David has to say to us. Um, you can read about Sir David in the programme, and I'm not going to repeat that, but I'm going to add to that. Uh, Sir David is the undisputed world champion at Loop. Uh, note these things if you're stuck for questions later. Uh, he, uh, one of the few people to describe Jeremy Paxman as charming. <laughs> he is amongst the six top scientists on Twitter, which I remind you has 328 million users, though perhaps not all of them scientists. Uh, and finally, he wrote a, a book called Sex by Numbers in 2015, which combines two of my great interests, being <laughs> maths and reading. <laughs> well done. <laughs> so, Sir David has spent his career becoming preeminent at things which we care about. In other words, uh, we care about what's happening and how much of it is happening, and we might call that statistics. Uh, we care about the significance of what is happening, and we might call that evidence. And then we care about what happens as a result of that evidence, and we call that action. And so David's going to talk to us about his experience of those things uh, in his remarks this afternoon. And then, with luck, we have a little bit more time to take questions. Thank you very much. Okay, great. Thank you, uh, thank you very much indeed for the introduction. Thank you all very much for, for staying behind to the very, the very end. Um, okay, so um, yeah, I'm going to talk about communication. I, I'm a statistician. That's what I've really done throughout my career, mainly in medical statistics. But over the last 10 years, I've become much more involved in public engagement and communication. This led me to take a, a particular view, and I want to try it out on you. So some of the things I say might not, you know, you might not like too much. You may, may think it's fine. So I'd like, really like to explore that. Um, okay, let's start with a story on the BBC last Saturday. New campaign urges women to avoid alcohol in pregnancy. And this is a story about a campaign in Glasgow, and which it says, mothers to be we warned that their unborn child could be at risk of irreversible brain damage if they choose to drink alcohol. So NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde hopes to set the record straight after years of mixed messages. Okay, so that was the message last Saturday, which essentially says, you know, any alcohol um, risks, you know, irreversible damage to your child. Okay, so that's the message people are going to get in, women are going to get in Glasgow. Uh, let's look at the paper published yesterday. Up to date, if nothing else, in BMJ Open, which is about the association between low alcohol consumption and, and uh, childhood outcomes. Very good paper, very respectable team from Bristol. This was commissioned by um, uh, Chief Medical Officer Sally Davis. Okay, and what they found was no good evidence for harms of light alcohol consumption during pregnancy, four days after that other announcement. And in the absence of any strong evidence, advice to women to steer clear of alcohol while pregnant should be made on the basis that it is a precautionary measure. In other words, there's no strong evidence that actually having light alcohol, which they define up to about two glasses of wine a week, is how they define it, 32 grams of alcohol. Um, fairly large glasses, two, you know, two unit glasses. So um, would be, uh, and that's what, and that's what, that was the conclusion. Okay, so how do we fit those things together? What's happened there? Um, if you look at the coverage yesterday, um, weak evidence that light alcohol use in pregnancy harms, not bad at all. Um, alcohol, again, fairly good, reasonable headlines. I'm going to talk quite, quite, talk quite a lot about media coverage, you know, because it's part of the communication. Um, actually, quite good stuff from The Guardian. Times, absolutely dire. <laughs> One of the worst, most misleading headlines I've seen in a newspaper. Absolutely outrageous. The article isn't too bad by uh, Cat Lay, quotes me, so that's, you know, that's all right. <laughs> now, what can be wrong with that? You know, she's obviously a favorite of mine. But the sub-editor who stuck the headline on 
said light drinking does no harm in pregnancy. In quotes. Now, first of all, nobody said that. <laughs> Secondly, nobody even thought that. That doesn't represent anyone's opinion in the whole spectrum of, of, of people who have commented on this story. So, you know, an, an unbelievably misleading headline. They changed it later on the online version. However, that's the, in the one I got. I was on the fr oh, by the way, it's on the front page of the Times. Completely misleading headline. So there you are. You've got, it just shows, I think, in this story just over the last week, the difficulty that you face. When you've got limited evidence, you want to give advice, you want to improve the public health, you want to be honest, and yet what you say might be mis misunderstood. So do you have to, in order to make yourself understood, do what they, they're doing in Glasgow, which is to say any alcohol will harm your baby? Okay, do you have to? And that's the, I think that's the sort of issue I'm going to be, want to be talking about today. Um, I, I, I work mainly not in public health, but in, in clinical work, in discussing with women about their, um, um, what options for after surgery for breast cancer, men after prostate cancer, um, whether to take statins, whether to um, uh, get breast screening, all that kind of stuff, clinical work. And so I'm very interested in the whole move before, towards shared decision making and informed choice. Okay, and some huge generalizations about this whole area. So I'm just going to boof. Which I, I think I could justify them. First of all, people vary hugely in their needs, their understanding and their numeracy. In terms of communication, one size does not fit all. Uh, in terms of our demands, I'll illustrate that a bit later, our demands for information, our comprehension, our willingness to, 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 to actually listen at all varies hugely. You all know that. Okay. But people want advice from a trusted source, which is what you would like to be. They want to, they, people do like to have advice. So the standard thing is, oh, you know, a patient might say, oh, thank you so much for telling me all that, uh, doctor. Now, what do you think I should do? Or what would you advise for your mother or something like that? People do appreciate information. They really like it. They like getting it. However, providing information has very limited direct effect on behavior. That's the sort of findings from Tracy Marteau and all these other psychologists investigated this a lot, that actually just telling people stuff actually doesn't change their behavior very much. So changing behavior is a much more subtle issue of social context, of what the people around you are saying and feeling, much more subtle than just giving information. So I would say, I'm going to say, in fact, that providing good information is a necessary but not a sufficient condition for changing behavior. Okay, so what is impartial health communication? This is what I'm going to be arguing for. Well, first of all, why do it? I think it's an ethical duty, and I'd like to explore it a bit later. That's why I'm working in this area, just because I think you should do it, and that's it. Um, it can contribute to the sort of informed choice that I've been discussing of people being able to make up their minds if they want to or otherwise being able to ask for advice. To encourage realistic expectations, certainly in clinical work, so that people understand actually what the limitations are of what they might happen to them. Empower public and networks, I think is really important. Um, you know, so I, I know some doctors who say that you know, the patient information group is one of the most important developments in medicine over the last 10 years, for example. Encourage, I love this phrase, immunity to misleading anecdote. This is an official scientific phrase. <laughs> Use it, yeah, psychologists, I mainly work with psychologists now, who've done randomized trials of different formats of convey conveying information, the sort I'm going to be showing later, and to show that it enables people to be less influenced by all this drivel that they read on the internet and that their Aunt Nelly tells them. Okay, <laughs> I'm assuming, and this is the big thing, that you're not in the communication and the provision of information trying to influence people towards a predefined attitude or behavior. You're not trying to persuade them to do something when you provide information. Now, that's the big step. Okay, but it's your job to try to improve public health, to try to get them to change their behavior, to try to get people to do things. So how can we fit those two things together? For my feeling is that what it does do is provide an ethical justification for societal level interventions to change behavior. And that might be giving advice, it might be regulation, it might be nudges, it might be pricing, it might be all these other things that we can do at a societal level. However, my feeling is that that sort of paternalistic approach is only ethically justifiable if, they also, if people have also access to balanced, impartial information. And what I'm going to be haranguing about, you know, grumbling and moaning about in my old man's way throughout this talk, is when those two things get combined. When the, the lines get blurred between trying to persuade people to do things and providing the evidence. In other words, when you select the evidence to just the, the bits that will make people do, try to do things. So that's what I'm going to be moaning about. Okay, 
So there is a, you know, people receive a lot of their, you know, health stories from the news. This is a real problem. This was a recent one someone sent me, a beautiful one in, um, you know, in the metro. Another reason to drink coffee, four cups of the hot beverage a day, slashes the risk of type 2 diabetes. Right next to the story about somebody sent into a coma by their coffee. <laughs> Isn't that beautiful, really? He's like, ah, what do we do? What do we do? No wonder the punters are, are, are uh, confused when they get that sort of stuff. And people do complain about, you know, what's the message, consistency of message. I'm sure you all know about those things. You know, how can we get a consistent message? So, there's, so I'd like to talk about a particular story I was involved in, what, what became known as Toast Gate. Um, this, was, this was the scandal of brown toast that came up. Um, this was the Food Standards Agency's campaign on January the 23rd this year about acrylamide on toast. Well, acrylamide can be a nasty thing at high doses. However, there is no actual evidence that it, is, that it can, will cause cancer in individual people, according to by the doses that people take to their burnt toast and their roast potatoes. Now, we know, don't wag, you know, wag your finger at me if you want, that absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. However, I would say it almost is when people have tried really hard to find that. There's been eight huge studies trying to, but they still haven't found an association. And at that point, Absence of evidence starts looking like absence, abs, evidence of absence, or at least evidence of something that's so small it doesn't matter. Okay, so um, we at the winter... <laughs> yeah, exactly. Now, this is not CGI. Toast was harmed in the making, <laughs> in the making of this thing. No, this is dangerous stuff here. I mean, this is like toast porn, this is. This is really, this is really dangerous stuff. So our winter centre, this is what I work in now, is trying to do, do something. We were lucky with this. We got the press release under embargo from this before you know, the thing. So we could prepare a blog and actually get this lined up to the journalists beforehand to feed them this, this sort of thing. So adults, you know, the point is the, from the Food Standards Agency's report, adults with the highest, highest assumption of acrylamide could consume 160 times as much and still only be at a level that toxicologists think is still unlikely to cause tumours in mice. That's from our blog. So, you know, that's, that's you know, okay. <laughs> If you want to eat that much burnt toast a day, I, see, I, think, I think the acrylamide is the last thing you're going to be concerned about. <laughs> so anyway, we got, you know, I got on the news talking about this, and it was, got quite a lot of coverage because we got it under embargo. Because of the news cycle, if we'd done it a day later, poof, wouldn't, nobody would have taken any notice. Because we got in advance, we could step in there. And actually, by 3, 11 o'clock that morning, essentially the campaign was over. It wasn't just us who had wrecked it, but actually a number of people. You know, a number of people. And uh, Food Standards Agency backtracks on cancer licks to spuds. Anyway, so, and they said 320 slices of toast a day. Could be, you know, so so um, the point is that was, I think, an ill-thought-out campaign it, it, the, the, without any evidential base to persuade people that this was reasonable advice. Giving advice without an evidential base is not a good thing to do. It, de for a start, decreases trust. Now, trust, I, I, I could give a whole talk, I, I will, you know, I can give a whole talk on trust. Trust is a really interesting thing, and I suppose I'd just like to divert a little bit into the, the, the period we live in now, with, I think, a genuinely a, um, a querying of, of scientific expertise, you know, an abundance of fake news and claims, the ability of people to find false stories, misleading anecdotes so easily through social media. This is a really important time, and we know that we know this. And I'm sure all of you would think, oh, well, we're a trusted source. We've, we should be trusted. And what I do, when that, which is fine, but actually the, the, uh, my, uh, my guru on this is Professor Honora O'Neill, a philosopher from Cambridge. If you want to get know all about trust, watch her TED Talk under Parliament. I really recommend it. Nine minutes, her life's work, which includes both cant and jokes. So it's, it's brilliant. <laughs> and basically her message is that um, you shouldn't try to be trusted. It's not in your power to be trusted. That is something given to you by others. What is in your power is to become trustworthy. And this is the massive distinction. Don't try to be trusted. Try to be trustworthy. Try to earn that trust. And for example, Office of National Statistics and UK Statistics Agency is now putting their whole sort of target and effort and, and quality banner under trying to be trustworthy. That is their crucial thing. I think it's a really powerful idea because it means, well, it means you don't, what you don't do is counter false claims by even more exaggerated claims. You, you actually say, no, come on, we're not going to enter this fray. We are going to be trustworthy. I think it's a really important thing. Okay, so how can you be trustworthy? 
Well, you want to avoid this sort of rubbish. It's the first thing. The, the, this is after the uh, the this is after Toastgate. This is killer bacon sandwiches now, um, and this was after IARC re released their thing saying that um, bacon was now in the same ca category as cigarettes in terms of the evidence that it was a carcinogen. Now that's a measure of hazard, the potential to be carcinogenic. It's not a measure of risk, but that got misinterpreted. The media thought, oh, well, that means. You know, bacon's as risky as, as cigarettes. Oh, no, you got mixed up between hazard and risk because of the bad communication by this agency. We spent ages, in the, all through the day, trying to sort out the mess that they'd caused by their initial bad communication. Now, what they did, you know, it says, and at the bottom of the press release, it says 50 grams of processed meat a day associated with an 18% increased risk of bowel cancer. Okay, that's a relative risk communication. And the psychological research has shown that is one of the worst ways to communicate risk. It's actually misleading. It's manipulative. It makes things look bigger than they should be. And it doesn't even tell you how important it is, because we should know that a relative risk on its own has to be translated to an absolute risk to know, you know how, whether this is something we should be concerned about. So it, obviously inexcusable, to be honest. So we have to go to another place, the CRUK, excellent website, brilliant communication from CRUK, real masters of it says around 6% of people will get bowel cancer anyway. So what we're talking about is an 18% relative increase over 6 percentage points. I know of no journalist that can do that calculation. <laughs> None. Absolutely. They all know they should. It's written in the BBC guidelines. They can't do it. They can't do it. So we've been trying to teach them. Actually, we just don't treat school kids, and then they, maybe they can teach the journalists. But... Um, so this is the problem. Now, and, and the nice thing is that people have sorted out now, psychologists like Gigerenza, Gigerenza and others, how you can actually work this thing. First of all, get away from percentages, get away from probabilities, get away from decimals, get away from all that stuff. Think about what's called expected frequencies. What does it mean for 100 people? OK, so here's 100 people, like you, smug, middle-class professionals, eating your granola and compote every morning. I bet you did that. Yeah, exactly. Sadly, six out of 100 of you will still get bowel cancer during your lifetime. Let's compare that with six, you know, with 100 slobs stuffing down a three-rasher, greasy bacon sandwich every single day of their lives. Uh, that's how many will get bowel cancer, according to the WHO. Do, oh, did you notice? That's it. That's it, the one extra. So all of those eating that every day for that one extra case. So the 100 is, um, we, technically we call it the number needed to eat. Ah, <laughs> oh, you got the joke. Thank you. Thank you very much. Nobody, <laughs> very few audiences get that joke. Thank you very much. Makes, makes it all worthwhile to get a laugh from that one. Okay. So, so that's 100. So you can do it like that and people think, oh, we'll pass the brown sauce. But actually... You still, well, it is a risk there. It's put there. I, I've cut down my bacon consumption since I saw it, but I'm not going to sort of rule it out completely. You know, start the day with a carcinogen, I say. So, okay, How, can we do better? Can we do better? I'd like to point to an example of where it has been done better, and that's the cancer screening leaflets, which were redesigned a few years ago for breast, bowel, and, and uh, cervix. Um, and under the, um, it was Mike Richards, who was the cancer czar, and he said, you know, from on high, that we're going to have a different approach because it's so contested about cancer screening. It's become such a battleground in the BMJ and other places. They did a review of the evidence, and they said, okay, it's going to be based on a new principle, these leaflets. Consider the offer of having, of, of, of having cancer screening. It's going to present the pros and cons. It's not going to make a recommendation to have cancer screening. Amazing. Uniform reporting of harms and benefits. And that's gone through. So if, you've, if ladies in the audience have had that, had that leaflet, they will have seen, um, well, their, what they see will have been depend on a citizen, what a citizen's jury thought. Because that's the other thing I've really learned over the last few years. Uh, Co-production of materials with the audiences. Now, I wouldn't do anything without focus groups, juries, or whatever. I won't, I won't even think of producing anything without having co-produced it with the potential audiences. Very moving, you know, presenting stuff to them. And then, well, they said they liked, they liked the stuff that I wanted them to like. I wasn't allowed to tell them what to like. What they liked was what the research suggested they would like, which is expected frequencies. What does it mean for 100 people? And also these expected frequency trees. 100 women going for a single screen, 96 will get a normal, four will get a recall, but don't panic, three women, you know, it doesn't mean you've got cancer. Most women who get a recall don't have cancer. Nothing there about sensitivity, specificity, accuracy, these really misleading measures. It just says, if you get a recall, this is on average, roughly speaking, the number of people who get cancer. 
So that's in the leaflet. Th these numbers are also in the leaflet. Um, this is now to do with the whole 20-year follow-up over the breast screening program, saying that 200 women going for screening between 50 and 70, 15 will develop breast cancer, 12 will be treated and survive, fantastic, 80% survival rate, going up all the time, three will sadly die early from their breast cancer. Okay, if we, if we compare that with 200, just like the bacon sandwich, 200 other women who don't, you know, similar women who don't go for screening, 15 will develop breast cancer, the same number, eight will be treated and survive, four will die early from their breast cancer, that's one extra death in the non-treated group. However, three of these women will never know they got breast cancer. They'll have a form, maybe subclinical, um, that won't you know, cause them a problem. They will go on, survive with this, uh, what they've got, and die of something else. So that means that three women here are treated unnecessarily, over, over diagnosis and over treatment. There's 4,000 women treated unnecessarily every year in this country because of the breast screening program, at the benefit of 1,300 lives saved or early deaths prevented. And those numbers are all in the leaflet now. Quite extraordinary, really powerful to get those numbers in. Um, what isn't in is the picture got taken out of the last draft, which I was very grumpy about, complained, no, no, too complicated. People didn't, I showed it to a focus group, they didn't understand it. And it is complicated. I can take anyone through that. You could take anyone through that. But it is complicated if you've never seen them before. But uh, you know, they wouldn't even let us have it in a little insert at the back or something like that. And I think that's a real problem because you know, there's a certain numeracy paradox with patient information stuff or new information that leaflets are optimized for people low numeracy. Reading age of 11, officially, and a very, not a, a, a numeracy must be similar or even lower. That's what they're written for. Um, but there's some evidence that people with low numeracy are not so interested in shared decision making and making an informed choice. We're, take a, we're willing to take a much more paternalistic point of view. So there's some evidence for that. So uh, the paradox is that the leaflets are written for people who don't want to read the leaflets. <laughs> so what that suggests, again, what I came back to, one size does not fit all. You need layered communication. And the really good websites on this to have multiple layers so that people can get down to the level of detail that they want. OK, I should just say about the expected frequencies, they're now in the GCSE syllabus. The, uh, you know, the GCSE 1 to 9 math syllabus now include expected frequencies and expected frequency trees um, for teaching. Um, and so in the future, <laughs> even if the journalists can't do this stuff, um, maybe the kids will be able to. And we've actually written a textbook for uh, school te secondary school teachers to teach probability in this way, using this idea of expected frequency. Very powerful. Okay, so, and oh, I should just say, what's the effect of this? This is the percentage uptake of mammography in England since 2006. Leaflets came in around here. Well, have they reduced, oh, they've cut the axis here at 60, you know, there's actually quite a tight axis here. Quite a tight axis. It was, looks like it was coming down anyway. Was that, is that a change point? You know, have they, has it, it certainly has an increased take up having this information. But they didn't, it, it wasn't done as an experiment, so we, we don't know what the impact of the leaflet alone was. Okay. But what that shows is that the aim of doing this was not to increase screening, even though increasing screening would increase the public health of the nation. Okay, so I, I'm just going to flip, I'm going to go through this very quick. Just for people who are interested in numerical and graphical ways of communicating numerical information, there's a lot of good stuff out there on the web. I particularly recommend this paper. It's freely downloadable. Um, it's very nice. It says decision aid developers, but really it's appropriate for anyone. Um, and I'm going to put this up. Um, was well, the right way to communicate numbers about potential benefits and harms, and I'm not even going to read those out. If you want to take a photograph of them, although you can, but basically... <laughs> That's a whole lot of stuff. Uh, except the one thing I'm going to say is avoid lots of one-in statements. Don't say, oh, there's one in 100 and one in 20 and one in 1,000 and that sort of stuff. Really confusing. So that's, if you want to take a picture, that's fine. But, but actually go back to that paper. So that's just my little bit of um, education if you want to do that. Okay. Communicating chronic risks. Um, uh, so this is the, uh, you know, bacon sandwiches, I suppose, but the, the lifestyle risks, the alcohol, the exercise, even the air, even the air pollution. You know, all those things. How do you communicate those? Things that affect you over your whole life. It's more difficult. And that's particularly because what comes out of the studies are these hazard ratios or relative risk, which are, as I've shown, not only incomprehensible, but manipulative if you, if you use those as your public communication. Actually, you know, they're very inappropriate. So, so what can we do instead? And I'd like to suggest some alternatives that we've been looking at and starting to test out on audiences. Um, an obvious one is the changes in life expectancy. 20 a day, nine years off your life on average. 
that, that kind of thing. You know, it's a standard thing that's been done on smoking. Um, changes in effective age. Um, you may know that the, you know, the heart age program on NHS Choices has been enormously um, popular and successful. So you, you put in your cholesterol and thing, it'll tell you how old your heart is. And there's some evidence that telling people about that can improve their behavior. If smoke, telling smokers how old their lungs are can, can improve their behavior. Um, notional daily effect, we'll come on to that one in a minute, see what you think about this one. Okay, so this was this, the, the, the recent paper, uh, yeah, last month, coffee drinking and mortality. Big thing, showing the benefits of drinking coffee. Very well, um, carefully, care, good press release. Very good paper, carefully written with the caveats and things like that. So on ITV News, one coffee a day for a man, extended life for three months for a woman by a month. That's what they reported. Source Imperial College. It wasn't the Source Imperial College. I was the source for that. Um, and also, cup of day, cup of coffee for a man, extra, eight, uh, extra nine minutes per, of, on life, your life per cup of coffee, three minutes for a woman. That was from me as well, not from the Imperial College. So that's what I call the notional effect of a cup. Nine minutes on your life for a cup of coffee for a man, three minutes for a woman. It's, what it's doing is trying to bring things to the moment, to, to an immediate, graspable impact of a behavior. You may not like that. You may think, well, where did you get that from? That's nonsense. I don't think it's such nonsense, and I'll try to argue why that, that is not such nonsense. Okay, I'm going to go back to, so, you know, these are the hazard curves for current age. Uh, for my, the main thing about these are on a log scale is that it's a pretty well a straight line, as Gompertz observed in 1825. What that means is that over a large age range like that, um, average risk of death goes up by 10% a year, 9, 10% a year. And that's amazingly standard across all sorts of, across history, across different countries, cultures, gender, everything. It's about 9, 10% a year. In other words, the relative risk for one year aging is 1.1, let's say that. There's also the relative risk, roughly, for watching two hours of television, a um, couple of cigarettes, a couple of drinks, um, et cetera, et cetera. So you could say that watching a couple of hours of television is, it increases your risk or associated with the same increase of risk as being a year older. So another way of saying that, you sit on your backside for two hours a night watching television, you're putting a year on your age, changing your effective age. Now, again, I say I'm, why I'm interested in that is that I th uh, changes in effective age have been shown to be quite, in clinical context, been shown to be quite powerful. So I, I, you maybe not want to look at all those, but this is just a whole list of exposures of drinking, eating bacon, watching television a day, air pollution, cup of coffee, and things like that. And these are the hazard ratios that come out of the epidemiological studies, incomprehensible, manipulative way to show the information. But you can convert them to the change in um, uh, effective age. Uh, first 20 minutes brisk exercise a day, hazard ratio 0.02, takes two years off your life, off your age, not two years off your life. <laughs> takes two oh, years yeah. off your age, puts two years <laughs> on your life. The next 40 minutes, well, you can do it if you want, you get... Um, you get an extra, you're a year younger if you're doing the extra next 40 minutes. First 20 minutes, though, whoa, it's great stuff. And you can convert that one year, you know, on your life, which is what that's saying, being one year younger is an extra year in life, corresponds to half an hour a day. On, you know, pro rata. Over an adult lifetime, about 50 years, um, that's, uh, it's about half an hour a day that corresponds to. Because it's about um, a 2% increase in your, in your life, in your life expectancy. So this, this is very notional, but it certainly brings things home. You know, smoking 20 cigarettes a day, about four hours off your life for every, every day that you do that. Um, two hours of TV a day, half an hour off your life. Per 10 micrograms per cubic meter, PM 2.5, 15 minutes off your life, pro rata. Okay. So what I'm saying is that this may seem, whoa, I don't like that. It's actually more rigorous than you might think. And so, for example, you can do this for air pollution. These are the annual mean 2.5, PM 2.5s, the excess over the WHO target of 10. These are the estimated relative risks from the latest meta-analysis. This is the um, reduction in life expectancy. This is the time off your life in minutes for every, every day you're in. On, on average, in, in living in Delhi, is about three hours off your life for every day you're spending in Delhi. And, um, and this is the equivalent number of cigarettes. So living in Delhi, at that air pollution, it's about 20, like smoking 20 a day in terms of the overall effect. So cigarette equivalence, which is quite a powerful analogy, I think, is quite strong. So we're playing around with these, you know, and just testing whether they work on people. Okay, 
So alcohol, let's get on to alcohol. Yeah, I need to finish in a moment. Alcohol. Now, alcohol's tricky because alcohol isn't like something, you know, cigarettes, you know, they're bad for you. And exercise, that's good for you. Alcohol isn't so, isn't so straightforward. Air pollution's bad for you. It's not, you know, you, you know, alcohol isn't so straightforward. And so there's a, people say that alcohol is a sort of the really tricky bit about communication. Um, no, another paper, recent, last week, people see this one? Just came out last week. This is from Mark Pittigrew's group at uh, London School, and this is how alcohol industry mislead the public about alcohol and cancer. So this is an accusation of the way in which the alcohol industry are using evidence on their websites. And what they say is that they, uh, there's denial or omission, denying or disputing any link with cancer, there's distortion, mentioning some risk but misrepresenting the size of that risk, and distraction. Focusing discussion on other things. This is the, these things have been disputed by the industry, but quite a powerful paper, lots of quotes from websites saying these activities are going. Making an analogy with the tobacco industry, who said, you know, our, our, our aim is doubt. You know, our, that's our target is doubt. So they're drawing strong conclusions about it, which is, you know, it's, it's quite a powerful accusation. Okay, let's look at how the official bodies work. Um, Public Health things, the uh, Chief Medical Officer's Guidelines Review that came out at the beginning of last year, I think it was excellent, really excellent. Proposed guidelines say people have a right to accurate information about clear advice about alcohol. There is a responsibility on government to ensure this information is provided to others in an open way so they can make informed choices. Yes! Hey! I was clapping and cheering when I saw that coming out. Really excellent. Now, and, and this, for example, is in that report, was the actual um, one of the tables in the report, presented in a pretty incomprehensible way. Um, we redrew it in a slightly clearer way, which would say this is a percent chance of dying from an alcohol-related condition for men and women, and this is assuming you um, units of alcohol each week spread over five days. So you're giving yourself a two-day break, units of alcohol. And what that, this is, I think, uh, Brilliant graph. I really love it. And that, this is from the Sheffield Group. So this is from the PHG report. Um, and what it shows rather nicely is that the new recommendations of 14 is round about where the lines cross, and it's where this is at about 1%. So that's why it's set, it's set at the low risk level, but a 1% chance it'll kill you, you know, very roughly, 1% chance it'll kill you. Okay. And what it shows, though, is that the steep gradient for women after that time, after that period, much steeper gradient for women. And it shows the dip, bigger dip for women, smaller dip for men among, this is one drink a, you know, um, drink a day, essentially, down here. Yeah, very, very light um, alcohol consumption. Mm -hmm. So I think that was, that was excellent. Nice, um, uh, nice work. Um, very reasonable guidelines. Very reasonable guidelines. But let's look at how is this communicated? How is this communicated? Here we go. Drinking any level of alcohol regularly carries a health risk for anyone. Well... That's not how I would have summarized those curves. And uh, new government warning, any alcohol raises your risk of cancer. Yes, for some cancers. Yes, it does. Looks like it's monotonic for breast cancer and other cancers. So there's a big focus on cancer there. And what did the Department of Health say? What do they still say on their website about this? Increased risk, they highlight with increased risk of cancer. Just mentioning the cancer, not mentioning anything else. And then they say, men should not drink more than 14 units of alcohol each week. Oh, thank you for the informed choice. I mean, really, men should not drink 14 more. I was, I was furious when I saw that. You know, there's a great report putting forward very good principles for communication. Then it gets to, well, I feel it's a comms team, and they come up with this stuff. The review also found that the benefits of alcohol only apply to women aged 55 and over. No, they didn't. That's not what the review found. So, you know, what's going on here? What's going on in terms of the communications of, of this evidence base, rather good evidence base? So I'm going to be very mischievous now. I'm going to suggest that someone does a study, not of the alcohol um, industry websites, but of the health promotion websites. <laughs> I'm sure yours is absolutely perfect. But many might not be, and possibly they might have denial or omission. For example, not denying or disputing the benefits of alcohol at very low, at low consumptions. Su suggesting consumption above the recommended level is high risk. Happens a lot. That's a bit like the, the women in pregnancy. Oh, if you're above low risk, you must be, it must be dangerous. Distraction. Focusing discussion on cancer rather than looking at overall benefits and harm. So I wonder, I just wonder if that, what we would find if we did that study. So that's my little mischievous bit. Okay, what we've been suggesting 
when the Royal Society did this, was to take that graph, which I really like. First of all, see this as a low, it's called low risk. I, I like the term broadly acceptable risk. It's one that health and safety executive use. So what I'm going to do is take a, a health and safety executive approach to, to alcohol. How would they deal with it? Well, health and safety executive, like, they'd never say anything safe. They never talk about a safe level. Really good advice. Which they take. But they talk about a broadly acceptable risk. This is one where if you're down here, you don't really have to bother to do anything else. But then they, what they do is always have two thresholds. They don't just say, oh, broadly, and anything above that is dangerous. Then they have a, an unacceptable risk. Up at the top, they have a high risk level, unacceptable. And in behind, they have a, what they call a tolerable region. This is the tolerability of, um, of risk structure that HSE have used for 40 years. It's been fantastically successful, not having one threshold, having two thresholds. So how does that correspond for, for, um, um, uh, for men, for, for alcohol? Well, actually, it works very nicely indeed. We can draw a line across here to say this is the unacceptable risk. I think I'd put it a bit higher, perhaps. You know, maybe at, um, you know, the standard level for, for risky drinking was 50 units per men a week, 35 for, for women. And actually, not very nicely, at that level, we're at about 15%. About a one in seven chance is going to kill you in your lifetime. It's a very nice idea. So we've been suggesting that, you know, you have, instead of just having a single you know, low risk and everything else, actually treat people with respect. People make people, you know, treat people with respect. They've got some intelligence to realize there's a level at which it's really dangerous. You must reduce. You must not do this. This is okay. And in between, you try to get as low as you can. What's known as the ALARP region in health and safety. As low as reasonable practicable. This is a, this is a aspirational target. Try to get, try to reduce. But you're not killing yourself necessarily by it. So I think I, I, I think that's, uh, it's work, that structures work fantastically well in health and safety. Why can't we try it in medicine? Okay, so just to finish off then, alcohol communication. Two thresholds avoids the idea that anything above the low risk threshold is dangerous. It also distinguishes male and female, which is lost in the 14 units. And I think it'd be interesting to try more imaginative analogies. Cigarette equivalent. Roughly, a drink's about two cigarettes. I think, you know, I think that's quite useful. Uh, no, drink, 15 minutes. Um, no, it's about one, more like one cigarette. More like one cigarette. A unit is about one cigarette. So a drink is about two cigarettes. Notional time loss per drink above low risk level. So you can say, you know, essentially say a drink, a reasonable drink, about a half an hour of your life. Okay, so um, to conclude. I think there's an essential tension that you'll face between trying to change behavior to improve public health, which is what you're concerned with, and the principle of informed choice. Now, how, do, how can you sort that out? And I just think that, you know, one's got to be really beware, I'm not saying you do it, of supplying in path, beware of, um, hang on, what am I saying? No, no, I got that wrong. Beware of supplying, yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, I know what it is, yeah. In a way that clearly intended to change. So you could provide the information, but frame it and select it in a way that is just trying to persuade people to do something by highly selective work. I haven't worded that very well, in fact. So I'd say that it's much better, perhaps, to leave persuasion to regulation, to price, marketing, availability, all those things to be shown to reduce alcohol consumption and nudges. And this paternalism is made ethical by providing impartial information. Okay. And the crucial thing is keep information and evidence and advice separate and keep control of the communications. I love communicating. I work with communications people all the time. Just, just keep control of them. So, so I'm sorry. I'll just really finish off. Just to show what can happen when comms get a bit out of hand, here's a lovely study very respectable, dull Swedish study on showing an association between brain tumours and um, economic um, position, richer people having slightly more brain tumours. And that, they said um, consistent associations, and then they said this could be due to um, better diagnosis in richer people. Okay. Then it got to the press release. By the time it got to the press release, it had become <laughs> high levels of education linked to heightened risk brain tumor. So it was nothing to do with education. Okay, but that was a better story, wasn't it? And then, of course, I think you can guess what's going to happen. By the time it got to the Daily Mirror, it had become, why going to university increases the risk of getting a brain tumor? At which point, <laughs> we should all start despairing and try and get another right. job. So right. just as a sort of warning what can happen if you don't keep some control. You can't control the Daily Mirror, but you can at least try to control your communications people. Thank you very much indeed.
David, that was absolutely tremendous. Thank you very much indeed. I know everybody in the room enjoyed it. And as you can see, people have got yeah. trains and automobiles to catch. So I think we are going to close, even though I know the room is full of questions. Uh, but uh, can we just close by thanking David once again? Thank you. Thank you. Come on. I got that and I talked to Rizzy much more freely about the alcohol stuff. Yeah.